everyone. My name's T. Bowie. I'm Dave Eggers. We're here uh, having a conversation on Treasure Island in the San Francisco Bay uh, for Litquake, the San Francisco Literary Festival. This is a... You've been here many times, Treasure Island. Do you ever see? This is under construction everywhere. This island used to be a naval installation. It's a man-made island in the middle of the bay, and now it seems to be they're finally going forth with uh, pretty elaborate plans to build a lot of housing and restaurants and maybe a casino and a water slide and some kind of uh, nuclear reactor. I'm just... <laughs> I was like, stuff. what? <laughs> but, um, but I thought it would be a good setting for the every uh, where this big tech company sort of takes over the island and builds their campus so that they can have a private and closed ecosystem where they have the best views in the world but they don't have to uh, be bothered by anybody. Okay, you're freaking me out a little bit because this is an island that I just pass by every time I cross the Bay Bridge. Yeah. Is yeah. that is that what you're going for? Are you trying to freak us out, like with this thing that's under our noses that we pass yeah. by? Yeah. Well, we live in the Bay Area, and we are s surrounded by and saturated by technology, tech companies, people that work at these tech companies. I think it's changed the culture pretty dramatically uh, in the time that you and I have been here for the last few years? decades. Yeah. Thirty years for you, right? 30 years almost exactly for me. So I got here in 92 and the changes are, I don't want to overstate them because I think that that's what everybody does. You know, it's changed so much that it's unrecognizable. I don't think it's, I don't think every last vestige of the old, arty, wonderful, hippie, anarchic San Francisco is completely gone. But I, obviously the changes are pretty dramatic. And I, I was trying to envision what might come next if you merged the circle, which was the company that I wrote about in 2013, it's mostly a search and social media company, with, if you merge them with a, an e-commerce company. Um, the biggest in the world. The biggest in the world. Yeah. And if you had that, all of that combined data and then all of the sort of the boots on the ground and the real world impact that company like Amazon has, what would that mean? And of course, the first premise or the first thing is you expect total outrage from legislators, uh, you know, regulators and the public at large, but there, none of that happens. They're wildly popular and people love the convenience of this uh, presumably benevolent monopoly. Yeah, benevolent monopoly is, yeah. is a good way to sum it up. Yeah, um, I think if you were to say to the average person, we, during the pandemic, people's reliance on Amazon got so, I mean, they accelerated yeah. to an extreme degree. People are ordering, you know, masks, and then they're ordering medicines, and they're ordering air they conditioner, therapy. ducts, and yeah, everything. And it's one button, you don't have to leave the house and all that. Well, um, I was thinking, you know, I'd been working on the book for years taking notes before the pandemic hit. I was done with the first draft, or many drafts actually, when COVID-19 hit. And so then I had to sort of think about like, does this change anything? And I think it just accelerated some trends that I saw happening, which is, I think that we're becoming increasingly uncomfortable being outside our house <laughs> because of, there's so many there's environmental impact there's like yeah. hassles with other humans there's all of the uh just sort of annoyances i think we're getting more sensitive about our interactions with each other and i think that if you were to say well what if i never have to leave what if everything can be delivered to me and what if you can tell me what to buy and what not to buy mm -hmm. What's the right salmon to buy so that no, nothing is harmed? You know, no coral or dolphins are harmed. Tell me what's the right thing to do. And if one monopoly were to say, we're going to tell you all of those things. We're going to deliver it to you. All you have to do is buy and live within your preferences. So that every has a division called PREFCOM, preference compliance, <laughs> which if you if you obey and stay within your preferences, things are inexpensive and convenient. If you deviate, then there are 
uh, punishments or, you know. Um, oh, right, public shaming. Right? Public shaming, there's that. Shame is always a very important lever for individual and larger societal change, at least in this. There's a lot of public shaming. Every person has a shame aggregate, mm -hmm. which is like a calculation of all of the things you might have done wrong. And, um, you know, it goes into what eventually becomes your sum num, a summary number. Uh, right, and this is all public data, right? Of like, course uh, it's public. It has to be. What's the tech that they use for that stuff that, that, that's used for, like, you know, Venmoing people and Bitcoin? What, I'm forgetting. I have to yeah. pause. Okay. Do you know that when you use Venmo that the default position is that all of your purchases are public? Yes. Well, you knew this. Yes, you have to Joe set it Biden to private. Know this. Uh, well, you know. And most people I know don't know this. So I recently discovered I was, you know, somebody was showing me on her phone uh, how she had access to most of her friends Venmo purchases and, and what they're buying like yeah the mm -hmm. uh, how much they paid to the yoga instructor yeah. to the uh, you know to you know and she had to go through and tell all of her friends you got to I don't want to see this yeah yeah and you should know but think about how horrifying that is that that's the default position right you have to know to not be revealing all of this what stuff. diabolical mind <laughs> would think like well of course the default should be that everyone should have access yeah. to every purchase you make. And I've read that that's the, it's like your public shaming concept. That's the that's the idea behind it is that we can't cheat each other if everybody knows what the, the monetary right. interactions are. And if you and if you don't want it public, what are you trying to hide? Yeah, exactly. You know, are you? Is there something untoward going on with your transactions? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, let's all have it out in the open. And this was not, I don't know if you noticed a change at a certain point, but in the early days of the internet, you know, 92 when I got here, it was all pretty new. And it seemed like... I think I was starting to use email. <laughs> yeah, starting. <laughs> and I, I actually thought when email happened, I mean, I'm always wrong about these things. Uh, uh, I was like, oh, email's just some fat. <laughs> None of this stuff will last. And so, but I've been so startled by the way it changes us as humans and how we've become so accustomed to wraparound surveillance of our lives 24-7. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. photographed at least 200 times a week in a given average, you know, urban setting. Well, that's okay, mm -hmm. you know any vehicle we get into we're being surveilled any store any public place there are at least you know a handful of cameras capturing us we live with this with absolute comfort and almost no outrage and we keep actually pushing for more Body and we cameras, push for and more surveillance cameras security Be cameras because there are so many good aspects of right. it mm -hmm. not that body cams have eliminated police brutality and um uh because the, the, there's don't. been just as many police shootings in this last year as there were in the previous years, even with all of this attention. And yet, there are, there's a little tiny bit of more accountability mm -hmm. than there used and to be. people publicly shaming racists and um, police killing people like that. Yeah. So. There are some advantages. Mm -hmm. And of course, when crimes are committed, often you do are able to find that person mm -hmm. very quickly. And so um, so I do have this, you know, there is this sort of thought experiment going on in the book where the question is, is there any level of surveillance that would be too much mm -hmm. if it prevented crime or made people feel safer? So at a certain point, the thought, you know, the proposition is out there that if we have ring cameras and we have public surveillance in every setting, what uh, prevents those mandatory surveillance cameras from being inside the home? Mm -hmm. And how can, it's, hard, it's a hard argument to make in this current setting that we shouldn't have them. Because what are you trying to hide? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you planning to do? Are you gonna commit an act of violence behind closed doors? Otherwise, why wouldn't you submit to uh, in-home surveillance how do you argue against it yeah 
I mean, they, as it, it depends on how you frame the argument, right? Yeah. It's, it's usually framed around fear, yeah. right? So if you can get people afraid enough of anything, they'll submit to anything. Right. I mean, that's where we start. And I think anything that provides a little bit of sense of safety mm -hmm. and certainty. And so the people in the every and those that use this company in this book are, and I think that increasingly as a species, we are uncomfortable with mystery, ambiguity, nuance, and the unknown. So anything that we can sort of nail down and say, well, that's taken care of. I got a camera on that. I got, my, I got a camera in my kid's classroom. I know that's gonna be fine. I've got a camera on my dog. I know my dog is safe. I've got a camera on my workplace every, you know, um, every corner, every stairwell, whatever, got that figured out. And now we get into sort of the numerical ratings and the analytics to help and the, keep track of that data. Right? Keep track of that data and also assess everything in the world that otherwise didn't have an answer. We didn't know how good a given film was, but now we have a percentage. So we know it's an 87.5 and that's taken care of. And when same thing with books. Well, you know, we aggregate the, this, or, you know, and now we know how good a book is. We know poetry, modern dance, all of these things are subject to this numerification, which I didn't see coming. Did you ever see this happening and you thought like, ah, that's horrifying, but it's too late to stop it? Or you, 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 were you surprised at the adoption of this by most humans? Of these metrics? Yeah. For putting value on things? Well, before that, I guess it felt like the world was curated by kingmakers. Right. Right? So there were problems with that yeah. too. Yeah. Like who got to be a kingmaker? Non-democratic, mm -hmm. uh, non-egalitarian. There were these certain gatekeepers mm -hmm. and what gives them the right? Yeah. So I think at some point I was like really into rotten tomatoes and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then at some point I stopped paying attention because <laughs> I kind of like some curators, like they're yeah. <laughs> thinking and they know, they know stuff about their topic. Um, well, we question expertise now. Yeah. It does seem elitist and non-democratic. So in the early days of the internet, that was the goal, this egalitarianism, the democratization of information and opinion and access to things. And then, but then it had this weird flip side, which was that nobody's expertise mattered anymore. Well, and you can also gain any of those things. Like, I don't know, have you participated in things where you get all your friends and their family members to like vote for something? And it's really just about like getting a lot of signatures or, or votes or likes yeah. or something, right? It's pretty artificial. Yeah. Are you admitting to something here, oh, yeah. T? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I think I did it to get like some money for the school I was teaching at. <laughs> I think these right. are the ways that you pimp yourself to well, get resources. You're, so we, we are living in service very often to an algorithm or to some sort of, you know, number driven metric mm -hmm. that can always be gamed. Yeah. And there's this, I'm obsessed with, and I don't know if this is the case at any you know, schools that you know, but increasingly student essays are being graded by machines. And there's all this very you know, um, eager startups that are saying, we'll grade your uh, papers quickly, instantly, objectively. And as a teacher, I'm like, that sounds amazing and also a little scary. <laughs> well, the machines can't read. They always are careful to tell you in the first paragraph, the machines can't read. It's just a tool that blah, 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 and then it's this mealy mouth stuff. But <laughs> think about it. We are sending, and many states send their exit exams and their standardized tests to these machine grading programs, knowing that the machines cannot read. So they're saying, all right, our student work is so precious, mm -hmm. and these young minds matter so much to us. And so to judge whether or not these students are capable of writing clearly and proficiently and should move on to the next level, we're going to grade these, these tests and judge their you know, facility with the written word by a machine that can't read. Think about that. Yeah, well the, the thinking before that is that we have to judge students in this numerical way in the first yeah, place. In the first place. Right? And we keep coming up with extra assessments because we're somehow afraid of our own just 
baseline assessments. Yeah, and the subjectivity mm -hmm. of like one teacher. Yeah. And I don't know if you've run into this as a teacher, but I do think that there is increasing discomfort with that subjective power of a teacher to say B, C plus, B minus, A minus, because yeah. what gives you the right? It's the kingmaker problem yeah. again. Yeah. So I instead see. we say, well, wouldn't it be more objective if it were an algorithm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's a solutions minded thinking that brings in tech to solve our old world problems, right? That's like, I think the big question here. And I was struck by how your book could be seen as a book that like sort of lays out the system because we're all like little tiny cogs in the system and we're just consumers. So maybe if somebody like laid it all out for us, like the big ethical questions and the dilemmas, maybe we would all like have some reservations about what we're <laughs> participating in. Yeah. But then you've got a lot of these characters who do have access to like the, the master plan, the big system. And instead of questioning it, they go, yep, <laughs> that's the solution. <laughs> right. I think that that's the, that's the water we swim in or the air we breathe in the Bay Area. I think that digital solutionism is like the uh, way of thinking here. Every, and even problems caused by digital tools are always solved by digital tools. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. There's a whole thread in the book where, you know, Delaney Wells is the protagonist and she goes into this company trying to bring it down from within. And her idea, or one of them, is to create like the worst apps and the worst notions and stick them into the, the uh, you know, the flow of the every and see if they create any outrage. So let's talk about the, the protagonist for a second. She's pretty different from the protagonist from the circle in the sense that the circle's protagonist went in starry-eyed into this company and then things happened. And then this protagonist, Delaney, goes in purposely to take down the every. Can you talk about that difference? Yeah, I... You know, May Holland is was that sort of naive, starry-eyed idealist, and now she came into the circle, and you know, at this point, ten years or so before this book takes place, and now she's basically the CEO in the face of the company. Um, she works in a glass box in the middle of the campus and is broadcasts her whole day. So there's nothing secret. There's nothing um, uh, private. To her life so she's trying to model this life and of course maybe caused by this way of life she hasn't had an original idea in a decade basically so there's pressures around her to think of what's next which I think is the case with a lot of these tech companies today right nothing new has been invented in a little while that's why you have things like the metaverse which is like you know announced a great fanfare a few weeks ago which is a ludicrous idea and it's a desperate stab at something that might come next just to try to energize investors and mm -hmm. and shareholders but delaney was a forest ranger for a lot of years and the last straw for her and she's a tech skeptic and the last straw for her was when through the machinations of the every they've made it a requirement to visit any national parks you have to have an every smartphone because it's safer because it'll give you you know gps tracking you'll have your maps and all that stuff and she said the last private place the last place where you can be free of digital overload the national parks the natural world has now been co-opted too so that's it i'm i'm through i'm going to get a job there I'm going to try to bring this place down from within. But she and her friend Wes, they keep throwing the most insane ideas into the system, and there's no outrage about any of them. And and there's and so I was trying to sort of create, in every case, ideas that are like kind of good in a way, where you're like, oh, I could see why you might want that, or that a lot of readers might say, well, there's a certain appeal there. There's an app that they invent that tells you if you enjoyed the meal that you just ate and how much you enjoyed it. Now, it's funny on the surface, but can you, could you really rule it out? Like, if that existed, if we, you know... What's the harm, What's right? the harm? Yeah. And maybe you get a little bit of certainty because you don't trust your own opinions. And I think that increasingly we don't. 
we don't trust others to make decisions that might impact our lives because that's subjective that's the kingmaker that's you know too much power in one individual's hand and then secondly it goes the other way where we're like how do I feel mm. how do I did I like <laughs> how was my day did I sleep last night mm -hmm. like we know if we slept or not well, we but, need there, a little watch to but there's us. so many <laughs> so many tools and they're so careful to say this actually doesn't monitor your sleep. It's just telling you whether or not you were still mm -hmm. during the course of the night or if your breathing was heavy or, or shallow. So it doesn't know if you slept. You know if you slept. And yet tens of millions of people are using these tools that offer this totally specious. My mother swears that she doesn't sleep, but I can hear her snoring. I, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, she's course. not one of those watches, Joe. We all know those people, right? <laughs> and now maybe it gives her some certainty, right? Because she, now you don't have to debate whether or not mm -hmm. your mom slept because now the, the machine is telling you. It still doesn't matter because she wins every <laughs> argument, so. <laughs> but you know what? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you notice more sort of reliance on these tools and more reliance on the numerical determination. Yeah, there is a um, there's a design element to it, right? I don't have an Apple Watch, but I think that they are ovals or circles or something. It's like a rounded circle. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, a rounded uh, square. Uh-huh. And well, no, the um, the things that track like your activities, oh, yeah. like you complete your circles. You, oh. you literally you close your loops yeah. if you do enough steps or whatever yeah. your exercise goal was. I'm like, that's really smart because yeah. it gives you that sort of emotional like comfort that you get from like checking. I have like a, a an old fashioned to do list and yeah. I get some comfort from checking off boxes, For sure. crossing out things. But that's such a sloppy old way or old world way to do it, mm -hmm. you know? And what if you, and, and if no it's on your piece of paper, of it for me. no one else yeah. is looking at it. Mm -hmm. You don't have the wisdom of the crowd. You don't have it being sent to some, you know, other centralized database. So it's just yours, which doesn't, and it also seems kind of selfish to you if you're just keeping that information <laughs> to yourself. What, am I to hide? <laughs> what are you trying to hide with your piece of paper and your to do list? I mean, but so I just saw this. I mean, every day I'm trying to stay ahead of things when I write something like this, but you can't stay ahead of things. And I saw this, I don't know, I'm always seeing these articles that I, I think are far beyond something I would have made up. But everybody's swearing by these family apps where no longer does anyone double book or over schedule each other or miss a dinner because they've scheduled something else because you have the app that all of the family's mm -hmm. plans go into. So again, instead of like talking mm -hmm. to each other about so maybe a the plan, there's yeah. the calendar right. or I'm gonna see you at dinner it goes through the screen. Have you ever gotten to a place where you actually want to hide certain activities that you booked from certain family members? Well, why would you do that? That seems very wrong. Nefarious, right? And so, again, when you have these centralized depositories of information, then nothing can be hidden. There's no private space. There's no um, time to just have to yourself that's unscheduled. I had a friend show me I think maybe 22 people that he had in his life that he knew where they all were at all, you know, because of find your phone or whatever, he could track all 22 at any given moment. That's a lot of people. Which is a lot. It's like son, grandson, you know, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, all of that. And at any given moment knew which highway they were on or went home or whatever. And this was a great comfort to him as a grandparent. And um, in case of natural disaster, I guess, you know, if you see if you can track tornado uh, routes and make sure that your loved ones aren't in the path of. A, but what's strange is just the way the most normal, all everybody, we've just become really accustomed to these extreme levels of surveillance mm -hmm. that would have been seemed a, incredibly expensive and impossible 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you'd need a team of 50, you know, FBI agents to do all of this surveillance. But now it's all cheap and available and it doesn't cost anything. 
but the, that level of surveillance that we're comfortable on the receiving end, but also that we feel like it's our right to know mm -hmm. where everything is, to measure everything, to know where everyone in our life is at any given time, it's yeah. our right. Yeah, and probably a good idea given the dangers of the world, right? Right. Yeah. So again, the, you eliminate private space, you eliminate unmeasured time, and you probably eradicate the possibility mm -hmm. of contemplation, of just like wasting a day thinking, you Sitting know? Sitting on a bridge looking at the river sitting on a bridge, living, that kind of thing. And that's why the every, as a company, they're desperate for new ideas. Nobody's had an idea in years because they live in this fishbowl. Everything is, they, they vibrate with this almost sort of paralysis about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing or doing it at the wrong time. Every minute is measured and planned out. So there isn't that sort of possible for creative possibility of creative anarchy that you sort of need to have something new come into your mind and so that's why when Delaney and Wes arrive on campus they've got ideas even though as silly as they are but everybody's like astounded that these new thoughts have appeared which often happens when the in the in the existing tech companies instead of coming up with ideas internally very often they're buying companies mm -hmm that have done something in their garage or their dorm room because they are apart from that closed, cloistered, suffocating ecosystem and they're still relatively free. You know, yeah, you know, as, a, as an illustrator, as a cartoonist, I, I think of it as like a too much photo reference problem. Too much photo reference yeah, problem? I like yeah. that, explain this. So if I have to research a lot of like environmental details or, you know, details about a person if I'm doing non-fiction stuff and I use too much photo reference it locks me into what already exists and I don't listen to my own internal eye that creates something much like that's much more interesting to look at ultimately yeah um, so I can see that that world becoming really uninteresting to itself right yeah right I want to ask about Wes but I first I want to just point out one thing that I thought was really cool about Delaney in that She's young, and, and this is happening later than the circle. So she's, she's, a, she's what they call a digital native. Yeah. And she's already had her teen depression caused by her parents buying her a really expensive phone. Um, and she goes from somebody who used to stare at, sit on a bridge looking at the river um, and spending a lot of time by herself, I guess daydreaming, right? To somebody who's like completely addicted to everything that she can do on this device. But then she, gets away from it, right? And that actually makes me think of a lot of young folks right now who are saying no to social media yeah. or um, turning away from the things that, like, our generation actually, like, really adopted yeah. with a lot of gusto. So it seems like maybe, is there, do you have some hope that there's yeah. some wisdom there? I, you know, I know so many, <clears throat> I can think of five teenagers off the top of my head that have all had to do digital detox programs in the last few years which I think is a so troubling that they have been given tools that they need to, uh, that are so addictive and present so much troubling information um, and are so overwhelming. The obligations are so overwhelming. I have a friend who's a school psychologist. Uh, she was at a major university and her caseload kept doubling every year. And finally she had to quit because they wouldn't staff it properly and she said I can't handle all of this because the students were coming in on day one of their freshman year already overwhelmed by just all of the obligations all of the messaging all of the decision making all of these things when we went to college it was like you know you had to go to Target and get your stuff you know and then you had your five classes that was it then there was a telephone right and the down in the down the hall that you used once a month to call your parents. I mean, in my case, that was it. And so, but now the parents are surveilling you. They know exactly where you are at all times. Maybe a thousand messages a day that they might have to send to and from friends and family members and faculty and everything. And in addition to that, a maniacal number of messages coming from the university itself, yeah. right? 
it's just too much. And so they were overwhelmed from day one and she, her job was just to try to sort them out and try to give them a little bit more balance and say, you know, to have a chance at learning anything, you have got to de-connect, disconnect Quiet from this mind. stuff. Quiet your mind, but you cannot do it with this device, which is a television, and it's a telephone, and it's a encyclopedia. I mean, it's 19 things all at once. And um, it's like, you know, doing your homework in the middle of a circus. And so <laughs> I feel like we, we are burdening these kids with something, with a problem that is too big for them to solve when their minds are still developing. And I feel like the fact that we have to keep sending kids to Wyoming or, you know, uh, Nebraska to sort of get away for a little bit and then we put them right back into that same high pressure overwhelming environment it's uh, it's too much and I feel like the solution is so easy if everybody colluded and said you know what let's figure out a system where we do everything we can to limit all the communication that comes there. The schools themselves should not be communicating through all of these digital tools and obligating the students to turn in their homework through iPads and all of these things. They are going directly against all the pediatric advice, which says less screen time. But then the schools themselves are saying, here's more screen time. As a parent, I'm also like, oh, I'm like really grateful for the text reminders about stuff. And then I then I also have a son who spends too much time on his screens. What if it's once a week you get a piece of paper and it says here's the homework and yeah. here's the uh, school dance that that's work. coming up? I yeah. mean, then you do it yeah. once? I don't know. I yeah. mean, it sounds like I'm an old crank that's just like yearning for bygone days. But I do think that when we are talking about young people's mental health, we have got to think this through mm -hmm. a little bit better and really try to say, there's a limit to how much they can take in mm -hmm. and how many obligations they can have when they're 13 or 14 years old and they need a lot of open unstructured time. Do you think we did this just because we're mad that we had to use like the Dewey Decimal System? <laughs> Why we have, I mean it's our generation creating all these tools, right? Yeah. I don't know, but I, th I do really think, because I'm more interested in the human response than I am like the motivations of the companies. And I think it's this discomfort with ambiguity, this trying to stamp out all the unknown. Mm -hmm. And if the digital tools give us that certainty, where is our kid at all times? Is the homework done? Can I have it all put in one digital file as, so I don't have to, you know, mm -hmm. collate a bunch of pieces of paper? Um, can I have a machine grade the, the, the test instead of a human grading? All of these things create a certain amount of convenience, but we are getting to the point where we are becoming less and less trustful of each other to sort of make decisions in the world or make a judgment about something or to say, I don't know, and there's no answer. So Dave, I'm asking this question as we're sitting out here talking about scary things but sitting in sunlight yeah. by the water so i feel like i kind of know the answer but i kind of want to hear it from you too <laughs> like the book is scary but it's funny yeah can you talk about why you wrote it that way well i i that's the the dichotomy i, I live with every day there's something horrifying at nine o'clock in the morning when I look at my email and then at 902 there's something hysterically funny you know, they're the, the often the same sides of or two sides of the same coin um, you know like I'll I'll hear from a friend who's uh, thrilled because he's got a device that will tell him whether or not he's meditating properly like and this is a real thing it'll ding when he's it, what? somehow is measuring brain waves or something and tells him like now you've reached nirvana or whatever that does not sound calming yeah okay. it uh, i mean think about that <laughs> like there's just no way to it's even i mean yeah it, it shocks you if you're not doing it right but that makes me laugh and then the next minute i'll read that there are so many companies now that uh have started up and accelerated their work or grown much more profitable during the pandemic that um, 
monitor employees' laptops at all times so they can see anything you're seeing, they know every website, and also measuring your, the quantity of keystrokes in a given hour to tell their employers if you're active and if you seem to be working at the right pace. Now, there's no protest in the streets about this. There's no mass quittings going on. People say, well, I guess this is their right, <laughs> it makes sense, and their employers are paying for my time. They might as well surveil me at all times. But so that that's the horrifying aspect. So I think that these two things go on every day and I was trying to create that balance so that we can laugh at what, how we live, we all live, mm -hmm. and then also sort of say like, isn't there something very troubling going on too that we could maybe draw a line here or push back a little bit there or say this is just far too much um, and it's changing how we are as a species. We're no longer like wild, beautiful, idiosyncratic animals. We are, um, you know, lesser machines in service to a greater, more reliable and objective machine. And I think that that's where I'm really um, scared that we're going. So we still created the machines in this world and we use the machines and we can choose not to use the machines. Do you still, do you still have some optimism for us? I do. I always wake up as an optimist on an ind individual level because we do have a lot of options still. We still can carve out a largely analog life if we really work at it, you know? I guess it's like being a vegan in Wisconsin or something, you know? You have to sort of work at it. Um, but you can still do it uh, for the time being. But every day it gets a little harder, you know? I keep finding that certain things that I want to do in life I cannot do without a smartphone. They want to look at the QR code. They want me to... And I don't have one and it's, it's becoming hard. I mean laughably hard in a way that my family laughs at me. And then we have another thing that I have to sort of find some horrible work around. But I am optimistic in that I think that we are, um, I think we still have some fight in us. Um, and I do think I always believe in the power of small groups to affect great change. But I think that people do need to speak up and, and, uh, and, and draw clear lines about where, you know, what's too far and what, and, and, car, and create and protect fiercely that last little bubble of privacy and private contemplation and sort of wildness that makes us, you know, uh, human. So, I don't know. I, we'll see. Ask me again tomorrow. I might have a different answer. I might be uh, wallowing in despair about where we're going, but I always wake up as an optimist. Well, if you ever lose some optimism, just call me up and I'll remind you of the ways that you've benefited me in just the, the short time I've been working with you, collaborating and even just going out to a restaurant and asking for a paper menu because you're going to read the QR code. I mean, you do it in a pretty, your resistance is pretty sweet. And Thank you. That's actually a good way to put it. Yeah, it's a sweet resistance. Resistance should be sweet. Yeah. I kind of like that. That might catch on. It's like happy warriors, uh -huh. but or sweet resistance. Yeah. I think that's a good title for your, uh, your next book. <laughs> I mean, so much of resistance is hard and yeah. fraught. Yeah. So I was happy to participate in a little bit of sweet <laughs> resistance. I love time. it. Well, I can't thank you enough for doing this, T. It really means a lot. And... Um, and I, we both love Litquake, and it's uh, um, we don't know what the city would be without that particular festival, yes. which is still a little vestige of anarchy and weirdness that and is a great so unique. To just talk to each other yeah. as writers, yeah. Well, thanks again. Yeah, thank you.